as, uh, as a vibration engineer, and he will also be touching upon his uh, recent uh, research experience as a PhD student in the University of Cambridge, where he was supervised by Dr. James Talbot. So thank you very much, Giuseppe, for uh, agreeing to give this presentation. And if everyone can now uh, turn off their videos and uh, turn on mute their uh, cam their uh, microphones, Giuseppe will now begin with this presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Socrates. Thanks uh, for the inviting me. Thanks for the introduction. I'm Giuseppe Sanitate. I'm a vibration engineer and uh, working at Rumble. Uh, and today I will give a brief overview of um, the applications of vibration engineering in the building in industry that have been involved uh, in the past uh, year and a half. Um, so uh, it is not meant to be a comprehensive uh, uh, overview of each topic, but really uh, a, a brief uh, overview of, of my experiences. Uh, and my understanding is that the, the purpose of this talk is to give kind of motivation to young people the, to pursue different career path. And I hope I can inspire some uh, vibration engineers uh, of the future. Uh, and then I will touch, as, as Socrates mentioned, I will touch on my previous experience on ground bone vibration uh, and base isolation of buildings. Um, so vibration in building industry, why we have a problem uh, with vibration, why we, we should look at uh, um, vibration levels within a building and um, it's there is no uh, kind of perfect way to illustrate this, but I thought I would start from uh, the receiver point of view. Um, so for a given building, we may be designing for uh, people, uh, if if uh, the building is an office building or a residential building, or we can design for uh, a science facility, uh, which is housing uh, vibration sensitive equipment with very low vibration requirements. Uh, and for, for that purpose, we need to, uh, you know, follow the uh, design of the building through uh, the different rebus stages and make sure that vibration levels within the building uh, where the vibration sensitive equipment is, for example, is um, appropriate for uh, the equipment to be housed there. Um, in terms of sources of vibration, we may have plenty of them. Um, to name a few, footfall excitation, for example, for uh, from the uh, normal use of space for people working uh, around the office. Um, we can have machine induced vibration uh, from uh, mechanical and electrical plants served in building. We can have construction induced vibration uh, due to temporary works nearby, either for a construction of another building or demolition. And we can have ground bone vibration from uh, road traffic or a railway line that is close by. Um, I thought I would just go through what would be uh, the steps for uh, the vibration design. This is a very uh, oversimplified list, but uh, it is just to really give you give you a flavor of um, what is what is expected during the design of the building. Uh, we usually start uh, with um, the identification of what are the vibration requirements based on the receiver. Um, and this is usually done with user engagement um, for the vibration sensitive equipment or uh, with reference to uh, uh, guidelines and standards uh, for human perception. Uh, based on the sources that are also on site, we propose the vibration strategy. Um, we integrate that vibration strategy within the building design, uh, liaising with the architects and with the structural engineers. Um, we develop the vibration design through the RIBA stages and we safeguard that design until uh, building and over. Uh, the first part of this process and the last bit are usually um, uh, backed up by uh, vibration service. As at the beginning, we want to make sure that we uh, can characterize uh, what is actually the vibration climate on site, uh, as it can be different depending on the external sources. 
and um, pre and uh, before the endover, we want to make sure the um, several sensitive location within the building achieve the uh, vibration requirements. Um, so when we talk about sensitive equipment, we usually refer, we often refer to an industry standard, um, which refers to VC uh, criteria curves, um, which are defined in the frequency spectrum as uh, um, RMS uh, amplitude, um, and each category uh, is uh, appropriate for uh, a given uh, sensitive equipment. So we can go, for example, for VCD, VCE, for um, very precise microscopes, uh, scanning electron mi microscope, uh, to VCA, which is uh, ISO 1 VCA, which is usually the one target for a general lab space. Um, just to give you uh, a, a flavor also of uh, what we do at the start uh, of, of a project we, when we characterize the baseline vibration levels for a given equipment. We go on site, uh, we set up our uh, triaxial uh, accelerometer arrangement and uh, we take vibration uh, measurements um, in the form of uh, one second RMS velocity in the one to 100 Hertz. Um, and here you can see the time history of uh, this this uh, this measurement. Um, and then we can also look at the spectra, how that looks uh, in the frequency range. Uh, we can see that in this case, for this location, we are achieving uh, VCE, VCF, with the, uh, with the exception of uh, a source at 10 Hertz, uh, which we can we can see is quite st uh, steady state, uh, probably related to uh, a pump that is just next door. Um, for human perception, the uh, the reference uh, comes from uh, what vibration humans can perceive. Um, and this is there are there are several uh, standards of reference, uh, British standards. It's also ISO standards that define this. Um, in the vertical direction, uh, humans are uh, more sensitive in the uh, four to eight hertz, uh, with uh, a, a, a reduced sensitivity at higher at higher frequencies. Uh, and this is the baseline acceleration. Uh, so basically what acceleration uh, a person uh, could actually perceive in the in the frequency spectrum. Uh, usually we refer to um, a response factor when we uh, want to compare how a predicted acceleration either measured or um, calculated by numerical by numerical tools uh, relates to this baseline acceleration. And basically, that gives an idea of uh, how much uh, the human perception threshold uh, has been um, actually uh, uh, has been uh, uh, has been higher or lower. Um, so this is used uh, basically in uh, in footfall induced vibration. Um, there are several guidelines uh, helping. Uh, the, the, the design engineer with the, uh, such a task to design uh, basically floors labs for footfall excitation. Um, there are guides um, published by the Concrete Center and the uh, Steel Construction Institute uh, for both uh, concrete slab and uh, steel concrete composite slabs. Um, just an, an example of this analysis, uh, this is a floating floor um, on a composite floor, steel, steel concrete composite floor, and um, basically uh, this is a footfall, uh, this is the result of a, a footfall excitation with people wor working at two earths at these four points. Um, the um, the main reason for this was that um, the concern was for the excitation coming from the corridor. Uh, 
which is in this in this area here, um, such that uh, we did with this analysis, we can check uh, what is actually the response factor uh, over uh, the the floating floor, which had the requirement of, of response factor one, so just perce just perceptible. Uh, vibration, and here we can see that we are with, within that within that requirement. Uh, this is an example of what we measured on site for a uh, footfall excitation. Um, we can we we did set up um, three accelerometers, one at mid span, one close to the facade, and one close to the column. And um, here is uh, a time history uh, of what we measured on site, and we can see clearly the transient response of uh, the stiff floor with the 16 Hz uh, third octave band uh, being excited uh, by the footfall and also higher, higher frequencies in the 20, 25 and 31 Hz. Another example of application is the uh, machine induced vibration. Um, and this is uh, an example where we measured uh, in a vestibule, uh, which is housing compressors and pumps uh, serving the next door uh, sensitive equipment. Um, and just to, to give you uh, a flavor of what we so these these compressors are on inertia base that is used to isolate um, the machine from the floor itself, and here we can see um, the measured uh, vibration levels in the vertical direction, and we have this local amplification here, which is an evidence of what is the isolation frequency uh, for that inertia base system. Um, and uh, here we have uh, a peak that is uh, much representative of a steady state excitation that is coming from uh, from the compressors at 50 hertz. We can use that information for um, another situation that we 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 may have uh, in which we have a ground bearing slab and uh, we have a shared equipment space uh, where compressors and pumps are to be located uh, adjacent to um, a sensitive space that is uh, housing labs and uh, sensitive equipment uh, so that we can uh, use the vibration inputs that, uh, that we have uh, to uh, do some numerical modeling uh, for a ground bearing slab on uh, an alt space representing the soil. Uh, and we can see uh, at 50 Hertz how that propagation looks. In this case, uh, all, all the compressors um, were assumed to be working in, in, in phase, which is a conservative, a conservative assumption, perhaps. Uh, and then we can also plot the uh, VC uh, maps that refer to the VCD criteria that I just mentioned before, uh, and we can look what is uh, the vibration performance uh, achieved in the in the lab space, and making sure that that is appropriate for the uh, sensitive equipment that is to be housed there. Another example is a construction induced vibration. Uh, we may have uh, excavators. Uh, um, we may have excavators and uh, uh, vibratory rollers and other uh, under machines working, and those are inducing uh, inputting some vibrational energy in the ground that propagates and can reach um, a, a sensitive building that is close by. So we want to give feedback to the client and help them. Uh, understand whether their uh, vibration requirement is uh, is uh, uh, safeguarded or uh, if if some measure and perhaps some uh, discussion with the contractor is needed and we can help the client by uh, building up a, a long term uh, monitoring system is basically logging um, the vibration levels measured uh, at the sensitive location and uh, we can compare that with, for example, the VC uh, criteria. And for, for instance, here we can see that at 9 a.m. in the morning there was an exceedance of 
VCE, VCD, so that uh, that may may raise a flag uh, that should be uh, uh, managed with. And then I just wanted to move um, to uh, the last uh, application that I will discuss uh, that is uh, strictly related to uh, my PhD topic. I uh, looked at uh, the performance of base isolation of buildings uh, against ground bone vibration. So here we have a diagram showing uh, some ground bone vibration sources in the form of underground railway. Uh, so basically, the both the roughness of the railway, the contact of the and the vehicle dynamics uh, um, just give rise to vibration that uh, is input in the ground. The vibration propagates um, through the ground and is transmitted uh, to the building through the foundation. And uh, the floor of the building start to vibrate and radiate and and radiate noise. Um, the main concern um, is um, the radiated noise. Uh, this this problem is in the 20 250 hertz, um, and as as you can see, is a complex problem involving that can involve multiple vibration sources in the surroundings, uncertain properties for the soil foundation system especially and complex soil foundation system often involve, involving pile foundation and in general a complex response of, 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 of the system. Um, as a mitigating measure what is, uh, is uh, uh, sometimes done is to mount the building on springs such that to decouple the building itself from um, the sub uh, the substructure system and from the source. Um, uh, there are many examples of base isolated uh, buildings for for this um, for ground board vibration, uh, starting from the 1960s, uh, the Albany Court building, um, but also the London IMAX Cinema at South Bank, London. Um, so my my PhD was really uh, the motivation for my PhD was really to help design uh, to help the design of base isolated buildings. Um, what is often used and adopted in practice uh, is is to uh, use uh, FEA models with some uh, uh, foundation representation and with some uh, source input or ad hoc software that uh, is uh, is able to model the whole source propagation receiver uh, problem. Uh, these are great tools that uh, the design engineer can use to uh, obtain absolute prediction of vibration levels within the building and uh, understand how the uh, base isolation, um, how much the base isolation is, uh, is effective. Um, they represent the whole the whole process um, of of the propagation, and they can be uh, tailored uh, on the specific case study on end. Um, at the same time, there are disadvantages such as high time and computational costs, uh, because it is a, a broad range of frequency that we want to look for the dynamic response of from 20 to 250 hertz. Um, Sometimes building up uh, such comprehensive models is difficult to control due to the large amount of the input parameters involved, and it is also uh, it, it can be also cumbersome to do the post processing uh, bit to 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 look at specific uh, response in the building. Uh, all this makes the the interpretation of the physics behind the problem a little bit blurry. Um, so the, the objective of my PhD was to come up with a design approach that would use simplified models based on engineering science and uh, help um, the process of uh, understanding the performance of the isolation uh, at an early design stage. Um, uh, the simplest model that we can think of for a base isolated building is the mass spring model. 
um, the isolation performance uh, uh, is, is completely defined by two parameters in this case, the isolation frequency uh, and the dumping uh, of, of the uh, isolation system. And this model completely neglects the uh, support that is at the base of the isolation system. So completely neglects the, uh, the soil foundation and the interaction uh, of the building with the soil. So the objective of, of my work was also to understand whether with simplified models we, we can do better than this. Uh, I started off by breaking up uh, the uh, model in, in bits and pieces, just starting from uh, an elastic house space uh, representing the soil with some in-plane wave propagation and looking at uh, the effect of uh, slab foundation as a concrete layer and then understanding what is the response of rigid regions uh, representing the contact with the, uh, with the building and then adding on top a 2D um, uh, frame representing the building to understand what is the change in vibration levels uh, after and before the building is coupled to the soil foundation system. I won't go into too much detail on, the, on this for time restrictions, but uh, I just uh, want to mention that basically looking at uh, this, this uh, one isolated column, uh, we can make some assumption. We can say that all the vibrational energy entering in this column is dissipating, is dissipated throughout the building such that no reflection occurs. Uh, and we can regard this column uh, as, as a damper if we also neglect the, um, the influence of the uh, bending response of the floors. And we can use also simplified models that is well known in earthquake engineering for the rigid footing on the slab foundation uh, overlying the half space, which is the cone model of uh, Wolf. Um, and these two basically simple components can give us uh, uh, some understanding uh, of the uh, underlying physics and can help us to uh, obtain a simplified model to predict the isolation performance. I will just touch on what metric is used to define the isolation performance. Uh, so basically, we have our building in the unisolated configuration and the, uh, with, the, with the isolator uh, mounted on the bottom. And we often refer uh, to the insertion gain as the ratio of um, the vibration at a given point in the building in a given direction uh, in the isolated configuration when compared to the same point uh, in the building for the unisolated configuration. An alternative metric that we can use is the mean vibrational power, which uh, looks at um, the power dissipated in a given region of the building within one cycle of excitation, uh, so that we can do a similar process of uh, comparing the power entering in the building for the isolated configuration and the power entering in the building in the unisolated configuration. Uh, this, this ratio will give us uh, the power flow insertion gain expressed in decibel. Uh, this, is just a, um, this is just a plot showing um, the power flow um, uh, within the building. I will, won't go into too much detail on this. Uh, and this is basically the result uh, for the power flow insertion gain uh, and the insertion gain in the vertical direction for this building system here. The gray points, the gray lines refer to the insertion gain in the vertical direction and mid span uh, of each bay of the building, um, whereas the blue line and the green and red lines refer to the power flow insertion gain, uh, referring to uh, this domain of the building. So a specific room for the green and red and the whole building for the blue one. And we can see that uh, by looking at the power flow insertion gain, we have a nice uh, averaging effect that is averaging the uh, resonance and anti-resonances of um, the building components. 
and we can see that that gives uh, gives us a, a nice idea of what is the isolation performance that at 200 hertz here for example is roughly 20 db um just for for sake of argument the dot the, the dotted line is the what we would predict with the uh, mass on a spring model without uh, soil structure interaction. Uh, so we can see that we will be uh, overestimating the uh, isolation performance quite a bit. Um, just to touch on uh, how, how can this uh, framework can be used in practice, we can uh, do uh, a similar to the two dimensional approach uh, for a case study and uh, by uh, oops, by looking uh, at simplified models for the pile foundation and for um, the components that are in contact with the ground, assuming a Winkler foundation, we can build up a substructure system. And also we can have our uh, 2D frame as before representing the superstructure so that uh, we can uh, solve uh, the ground board vibration uh, problem for the building uh, in with uh, being efficient uh, computationally. This is very advantageous in the early stage of design or uh, when also at a later stage when uh, several uh, design options may need uh, to be assessed before taking a decision. Um, yeah, so in this case, for example, this is uh, the 2D uh, frame um, that is built for the superstructure and the substructure. This is based on the dynamic stiffness method and this is regarding each element as a beam, beam, Timoshenko beam bar element. Um, and then we can look at the spatial, spatial average uh, velocity within each element. Uh, uh, and we can see the difference between the unisolated case and the isolated case. This case for the 125 Hertz, uh, we have more than three VC bands uh, difference, uh, which is a factor of, uh, of 10 approximately, which is uh, basically 20 dB uh, that we, we were seeing before. So not so different from um, the idealized uh, model looked at uh, in the discussion before. Uh, thanks for your attention. I hope this was uh, helpful uh, to give you an overview of uh, what a vibration engineer does in on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, thanks everyone for listening. Uh, thank you very much for Giuseppe for this very interesting and informative presentation that combined both your uh, industry and your research experience. It was uh, very interesting. Thank you very much again for accepting to present. Uh, before I introduce the next speaker, I'd just like to apologize because it just, uh, it just has come to my attention that there's been an issue with an expired link that many people had, access, had trouble accessing the event from the start. So I believe the issue has now been resolved and if anyone uh, is actually uh, accessing an expired link, Fiona has now pasted the, the the correct link in that chat, so hopefully everyone who uh, wanted to access this event may now be um, be with us in attending the event. It just may probably be uh, an issue with missing the start of the event. We apologize again for that. So the next speaker is Tiesel. Tiesel is a research student currently working in the University of Cambridge under the supervision of Dr. James Talbot, and he will be presenting to us his uh, latest research findings as he's currently working on, the, on predicting dynamic response of foundations and buildings near underground railways. So Tiesel, um, thank you very much for agreeing to present alongside uh, Giuseppe, and um, you may now start your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Socrates, for the kind introduction. Um, yeah, so my presentation today will mainly focus on uh, the, the numerical side of modeling um, for ground bone vibration and looking at the particular problem when you have foundations that are, and buildings that are next to underground railways. So the main problem um, that I was specifically looking at is when you have uh, buildings that are, as I said before, constructed um, close to railway uh, tunnels. And this is a particular problem in urban cities um, such as London, where um, especially Transport for London has received um, over the last 
couple of decades, quite a lot of complaints from uh, residents of uh, build res people living in residential buildings and also office buildings which are located uh, close to underground railways. Um, so, um, um, so there's been a rise in complaints, um, and the main source of the vibration that is being generated here is when you have um, the trains uh, are running through these tunnels, and at the wheel rail interface, you get uh, waves that are generated, and these uh, waves propagate out as ground bone vibration uh, throughout the tunnel, and then they can uh, propagate out uh, through the soil, and then interact with uh, other nearby surrounding uh, building and foundation structures. Um, so the main frequencies that we're dealing with, as Giuseppe mentioned before, are between 1 and 250 hertz. Um, and we can classify the, the frequencies into two different um, uh, classes where we have vibration between at 1 and 80 hertz. Um, and then we have re-radiated noise that is generated at slightly higher frequencies between 80 and 250 hertz. Um, and the main problem with uh, modeling these type of uh, dynamics is because uh, we have a lot of complex soil structure interaction effects that happen when we have uh, the tunnels very close to the uh, foundation and then we get waves that are interacting between the, found, uh, the foundations and the tunnel and then uh, it also affects how these vibrations transmit into the building. And there's also a great need to design better design practices that uh, engineers can use to Look at ways uh, such as Giuseppe has mentioned, our space isolation to reduce the vibration that is transmitted into the building. The main gaps in the literature are um, one of the main uh, uh, problems with these vibrations is we need to use computationally efficient models um, to um, account for the vibration interaction effect. Um, but most uh, numerical models neglect the tunnel foundation coupling that occurs when we have. Uh, vibration uh, waves that is illustrated here where we have waves uh, transmitting propagating out from the tunnel um, and then they can excite the foundation at the top um, but one thing that they neglect is how these waves once the foundation excited is excited we get waves that are propagating back towards the tunnel and this can create a coupling effect between the tunnel and the foundation which needs to be accounted in numerical models um, there's also a lack of physical understanding about the main parameters as, say, maybe the density of the soil, um, the stiffness of the pile, or even the length of these particular piles, and how they govern the overall foundation response. Another thing that we need to also account for is um, soil, foundation interaction, soil foundation interaction when we're looking at uh, the overall vibration that is transmitted into buildings. Um, and this is a particular issue because when we have say long wavelengths as um, uh, when you have low frequency waves when you're dealing with uh, say earthquake uh, seismic engineering you have a uh, long wavelengths um, which are much larger than the gaps between the tunnel and the foundation also the gaps between the piles it themselves so which means that you get less interaction however when you go into the more higher frequency ranges you get uh, you get uh, short wavelengths which are of the order of magnitude as say the gaps between the piles themselves and this causes soil interaction effects, which need to be accounted for in the models. So as Giuseppe touched on before, we can use um, insertion gain as a, a performance metric to account for the vibration. Uh, change in the vibration when we make uh, between uh, two different configurations of the building. Um, say we have if a, uh, where we measure the displacement for one configuration to and then compare it against configuration one and then that's usually measured in units of decibels um, and then the uh, particular differences that we want to account for is when we have the greenfield response is the response that we measure at the top of the ground when we just have the tunnel um, located uh, without any other nearby structures is represented by us and then we have the added foundation effect which is when we add in the foundation and now we have uh, a difference between the risk displacement at the top of the foundation and the displacement um, in the greenfield response. Um, and then we get a, another effect where we add in the building and then uh, this again modifies the displacement that we measure at the um, base of the building. And what I'll may mainly be focusing on is the added foundation effect, which is how the foundation modifies the response when you don't have 
um, when you don't consider the foundation in the soil itself. Um, and then the other uh, performance metric is the power flow, where we uh, look at uh, multiply the force at a particular location by the velocity. And this gives an overall uh, quantification of the vibration of power that is entering the building. And this parameter is measured in watts. Um, and then we can use the power flow to calculate the power flow insertion gain. Um, and then again, use that to compare between different configurations of the building. Um, so in this case, we can compare when we have an isolated building compared to when we have a un unisolated case of the building um, represented by a set of base isolation uh, springs. And again, this is a, a similar to the insertion gain. This is measured in units of decibel. So I'll talk about the modeling, the particular coupled tunnel foundation model that we've been able to produce. Um, so this starts off with first accounting for the vibration that is propagating out from the tunnel. And for this, we will we are using a pipe in pipe model, which was developed by Sane and Hunt. Um, and this is a representation of what the uh, train and the track uh, railway track looks like at the within the tunnel itself. Um, I won't go into too many details, but this uh, about the model. But uh, we can represent the track and the uh, mass of the train as particular point masses, some beams for the rails and the slab, and also some springs for the rail pads, and also the self uh, consolidating uh, concrete for the connection with the base of the tunnel insert. Then to account for the piled foundation, we use a boundary element method. This is similar to FEA um, finite element modeling, but in this case, we only um, uh, account for the mesh only includes the interfaces between uh, the soil and a particular structure. So here we have the foundation, and then we have a separate model that is representing the mesh that is representing the underground railway tunnel. And then to account for the uh, tunnel foundation coupling that I mentioned before, where you have waves propagating between the two substructures. We use an iterative approach to account for this uh, um, interaction, to, uh, to account for the coupling between the two systems. So first, I will talk about the simple uh, initial parametric study that we did for the simple case of just one pile next to an underground railway tunnel. And in this um, um, particular study, we were measuring the vertical insertion gain. Um, so this is as a, just to remind as a reminder, the insertion gain is a measure of the dis response at the top of this particular pile when we have the pile in place and when we measure the response with uh, when we are neglecting the presence of the pile. Um, and the particular parameters that we were looking at is the soil pile density ratio, um, the difference between the density of the soil and the pile. And we varied that between particular values for concrete and steel for the pile. And then we did the same for the Young's modulus, or also known as the stiffness ratio, uh, again between concrete and steel, and then varying the pile length between 5 and 55 meters, and also the tunnel depth between 10 and 40 meters. The main conclusions that we got from the parametric study is that, uh, the, first of all, we found that pile density, varying the pile density has little or no effect on the insertion gain uh, measured at the top of the pile. Um, and also there was no significant effect on the insertion gain when we were considering particularly very short piles. So these are piles around the order of five meters. So when you add in these piles, we don't see any uh, difference when varying either the stiffness of these particular piles. Um, but then when we increase the length of the pile, um, which is defined by this length with, uh, with this parameter, which is the length of the pile divided by the depth of the tunnel. Tunnel. If this is less than one meter, which means that it's above the pile toe is above the tunnel crown, we see that there's a soil stiffening effect which uh, decreases Ig as pile length increases. And we also, and as we get to a, when we the pile toe to decreases to about the same depth as the tunnel, we see a counteracting effect where we instead instead of seeing a decrease, we see an increasing insertion gain. And we believe this is due to efficient vibration transmission um, up the pile and causes the vertical vibration at the top to increase in magnitude. Um, and then as we increase the pile further down, so going past the base of the tunnel, we see no further change in insertion gain. 
another um, factor that we saw was um, changing the pile length for relatively flexible piles has no or little effect on the insertion gain. Um, and another, so this is another study that we did where we were particularly looking at uh, pile soil pie interaction. So this is the interaction where you have, instead of uh, previously when we were just looking at one pile, when we have multiple piles, you can get wave interaction between um, neighboring piles themselves, and this can affect the interact the insertion gain that you measure. So in this case, we have we're comparing against three con different configurations where we have configuration one where we have a single pile, and then configuration two and three are both considered five piles next to each other. But then we can change the positions of the neighboring piles around them, and this plot shows the vertical insertion gain measured at the pile that is directly above the tunnel in each three cases. Um, and then uh, plotted against frequencies between 0 and 80 hertz. And we see that at uh, low uh, frequencies under around maybe 50, um, 60 hertz, we see that there's no difference in the response measured at the top of the, these particular piles. But then when we go above 60 hertz, we see these differences around uh, plus or minus 10, uh, 5 dB, which occur because of this uh, pile soil pi interaction. Um, so this is the difference that is caused by when you have um, different arrangements of piles next to each other, and you see this effect happening particularly at the higher frequencies. Another thing um, factor that we were looking at is, as I mentioned before, uh, accounting for tunnel foundation coupling. Um, so in this case, we looked at um, another uh, pile foundation configuration where we have, um, in the plan, plan B, we have six piles arranged uh, along the length of the tunnel. So this is the top view from the ground. And this is the side view. Um, so the tunnel is beside the, uh, the particular found pile foundation. And what we're doing here is measure, changing this uh, distance here, which is uh, the tunnel, the separation, the transfer separation distance between uh, the tunnel and the uh, um, foundation. And then comparing how the response differs when we use a when we account for coupling and then we when we neglect coupling um, and then these three sub figures show first of all the longitudinal response so this is along the length of the tunnel the transverse response which is uh, in the sideways direction and again the vertical response um, in the z direction and these contours plot show uh, the, these different colors show when you have uh, um, so when you have big differences between the coupled and the uncoupled responses you either see the red or the blue um, colors in the plot. And then when you see no difference between the couple and the uncoupled responses, that's when we have green in the particular contour plot. Um, so if, as we can see, um, and these two particular lines represent the, the wavelength. So we have this um, shear wavelength in the soil which is represented by this line as we can, and you can see that this decreases as we increase in frequency and this represents twice the uh, wavelength. Um, and what we can see is most of the differences between the uncoupled and the coupled uh, responses occur at when the uh, distance, uh, when the dis um, transverse distance is um, less than the uh, wavelength in the soil, um, which makes sense because when we um, um, increase, when we have sh um, short wavelengths, we expect to see more in uh, soil uh, interaction between the uh, foundation and the tunnel itself, uh, because then in these cases the wavelengths are of the same order as this distance, order of magnitude, and that accounts for this uh, coupling that we see at, uh, particularly when the distance is much shorter than the wavelength. Um, and then another thing that we wanted to look at is where we whether we can use simple models uh, to, especially to model tall buildings, because currently, as Giuseppe mentioned, we um, uh, Normally, we would use uh, complex uh, finite element models to account for the vibration that is being transmitted into the building. But if we use uh, simple computationally efficient models, we can uh, do multiple simulation runs for a particular configuration of the building um, and then account, uh, see how changing different parameters can vary the overall vibration. Um, so the first simple models that we considered was um, a portal frame model. Um, so this is where we only uh, uh, represent the building as a simple frame and then account uh, model 
uh, each each individual elements as Euler Bernoulli uh, beam bar elements um, to discretize the frame. And in, in this particular model, we account for the two flow coupling that occurs between when we have a flow connected to the column, and it also accounts for the modal behavior. So these are the resonances that resonances anti resonances that are accounted for in the particular structure. And then we can make a further simplification by neglecting the uh, flows themselves. Um, so this neglects two flow coupling, and then we only account for the independent columns in the independent final length columns of the building. And uh, we can make a further simplification by um, assuming that the since the buildings are tall, we can assume that most of the vibration that is transmitted up into the columns does not is not reflected back down um, towards the foundation. Um, so this um, means that we can uh, model them as uh, model the columns as being semi infinite in length. Um, and this means that uh, since we are have since we have no vibration that is being trans uh, transmitted reflected down uh, towards the base of the columns, we have no modal behavior. Um, however, we've uh, and sorry and we the reason we call this a dashboard model is if we go through the derivation of the equations of motion for the system, we find that the semi infinite columns can be represented by equivalent dashboard uh, equivalent dash, uh, set of dashboards. And we find that um, the dashboard models are able to um, account for most of the dynamics of the uh, model when we have compared to the portal frame model. So um, dashboard model slight, does slightly underpredict the vibration that is being transmitted into the building, but it can still account for the general trends, and uh, which is what we're mainly interested in when we want to account for the overall vibration that is being transmitted into the building. Using this uh, dashboard model, um, the final sort of slides uh, of this presentation will focus on a virtual case study that we did um, when we wanted to understand how changing the location of the building relative to the tunnel and how uh, changing the, maybe a particular path configuration can affect the overall vibration that is being transmitted into the building. Um, so in this case, we have uh, continuing a particular tall 10 story building. Um, um, this is a three dimensional model of the building. So we can see this is the side base view of the building. And then from the plan view, we have a uh, 25 piles, so five pile by five pile. Um, oh, sorry, um, five columns by five columns for the building. And there's also uh, 25 coupling points between the base of the building columns and then the piles themselves. And the model for the particular foundation building model is for the uh, foundation building system is a dashboard. We use dashboards to represent the building, and then uh, the uh, piles are represented by the boundary element method that I mentioned earlier in the presentation. And the three config, three different configurations that we're look we're looking at is uh, this is the baseline configuration where we have the piles directly above the tunnel and they're 20 meters in depth. And then this is a more a worst case scenario configuration where we increase the length of the piles which are next to the tunnel and then shorten the length of the other piles. And this is more uh, what a vibration engineer would do normally. If you were to construct a building, you would want to construct it far away from the uh, railway tunnel. So in this case, 30 meters from the center line. Um, so in this case, we're looking at the added foundation effect of these three different configurations. Um, so in this case, we're measuring the mean insertion gain um, that is um, being transmitted into the building. So comparing, uh, sorry, in, just considering the foundation itself, how uh, what happens when we add the foundation, how that affects the vibration response that we measure. So anything above zero dB is is get amplification and attenuation when it's below zero dB. Um, and then we're measuring the transverse insertion gain and the vertical insertion gain. We see that um, overall the added due to the added foundation effect, so, it, so the soil structure interaction within the soil, um, we can get variation of around 10 plus or minus 10 dB in the insertion gain. And that is because we see significant soil structure interaction that is happening within the soil. Well, if we were to look at the added building effect, so this is when we add in now the dashboards represent the building. We see that the insertion gains are now 
roughly around zero dB, which means that adding in the building that is not significantly altering the, the response that we're measuring at the top of, uh, at the um, coupling points between the uh, building and the piles for it, all three different configurations. Um, yeah, so as I said, it, the, we find that the insertion gain remains close to zero dB over most between zero and 80 hertz. Um, and that means it doesn't, the, constructing the building does not significantly modify the vibration. And then the other uh, final thing we looked at was look at the mean vibration of power. So we used the power flow insertion gain to compare um, configuration one against configuration two and three. Um, so the dash line in this figure is plotting configuration two, the response in configuration two divided by the response in one, and the same for three divided by one for the uh, solid line. And we see that configuration, um, especially for configuration two, we see this amplification in the PFIG, particularly at high frequencies. And this we believe is because due to the solid structure interaction between when we have the piles that are relatively close to the tunnel, and also because the piles are around the same depth as the tunnel itself um, causes this amplification. Uh, whereas when we move the uh, tunnel uh, foundation further away, we get uh, attenuation in as we see as we see in configuration three. So the main conclusions um, that I hope you can um, get out from this presentation are is that um, the ground vibration transmitted from underground railways is a big problem, particularly in urban cities, and we need to look at models to account for the complex interaction that is happening in the soil. Um, and to, um, to measure the vibration, we, we use two, these two particular performance metrics, the insertion gain and the power flow insertion gain. Um, as I said, you can have piles or piles. The interaction between the piles themselves is important to consider when you're modeling, modeling the foundation dynamics. Um, tunnel foundation coupling is also can be significant, um, especially when the separation distance between the tunnel and the foundation is around the same order or less than the wavelengths in the soil. Um, and then using simple models such as dashboards is good for to capture the essential dynamics of particularly tall buildings. And finally, we see that the added foundation effect causes more significant variation compared to the um, added building effect. Um, so in other words, adding in the foundation cause the large, uh, larger difference in the vibration due to these two particular effects uh, compared to just adding the building itself on top of the foundation. Um, yeah, so I hope uh, you're able to understand a bit more about the numerical modeling that goes behind uh, accounting for the interaction between foundations and foundation building systems and underground railway tunnels. And I would also like to thank uh, my supervisor, Dr. James Talbot, for uh, guiding me and helping me throughout uh, during my PhD. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tiesel, very much for this presentation. It's very impressive to see how uh, you can uh, simplify such a complex problem with this uh, models that you developed. Uh, I will now like to um, to give the opportunity to the audience to ask any question to either of the uh, two presenters. So feel free to either type any questions in the chat or raise your hand and I can uh, call your name and you can unmute and then you can ask the speaker directly. Let me know if you guys see anything that I'm not aware of. Perhaps I, I can um, um, start with a, a simple question that I had perhaps more for Giuseppe. I was wondering, have you ever had the, the case in the industry where you have to design a building to um, isolate from both seismic and the ground borne vibration? Do you have ever, this, this is the case where that the purpose is to protect the building from both types of vibrations? Uh, personally, not, <laughs> to be honest. But uh, I, I can see that happening in a, in a huge city, uh, in an earthquake-prone area, uh, Istanbul or, I don't know, any 
uh, big city where where you usually have um, a tall building and you need to base isolate for for some reason against the earthquake and then you also have a railway line close by. Uh, I don't know how how often that can can happen. <laughs> Because I imagine it could be, as I think uh, maybe Tiesel touched upon it, that it, we're talking about different types of frequencies, so it might be difficult to satisfy both criteria of uh, isolating from both a seismic event and uh, and uh, vibration, ground-borne vibration. Yes, it's it's two dif dif different principles of isolation. Uh, for earthquake, you are relying on the nonlinear behavior of the isolation itself. Um, Whereas uh, here in ground borne vibration, the amplitudes are so small that we are in the linear regime. Um, uh, it's it's a good question. Uh, I'm I'm not sure um, how does the the stiffness of the isolation used in earthquake engineering compares with uh, with that in in acoustics. But uh, I don't I don't I don't think it's is. Um, is that different in, in terms of uh, how soft it is compared with the stiffness provided by the building? All right, thank you. So we have our first question from Nick Hucker. Are you generally considering homogeneous soil in your work? How important is the soil model in the prediction of vibration? Yeah, so I think I can answer that. So in um, our models, particularly, we were focusing on homogeneous soil, um, even though it does not physically represent realistic soil where you have such thing as soil layering and water tables coming into effect. Um, the reason we use homogeneous soil is to mainly simplify the model so that uh, is, um, and I assume that if you were to um, in, uh, account for these inhomogeneity or like um, soil layering, you'd get more soil structure interaction. Um, so the interaction between the structures will be more significant when you have um, more reflections going on between different medium that have different particular properties. All right, thank you very much, Tiso. Um, I think here we don't have a question, it's just a general remark. Uh, many thanks for both Giuseppe and Tiso for your excellent presentation. I think Nick is happy with your response, Tiso. Any other questions from the audience? So we have a question from Fiona. Is the aging underground network in London and other cities having an impact on the number of reporting problems with rail-induced vibration? Um, so I think, uh, I'm not sure directly about uh, aging, but um, I believe that um, one of the problems that is causing more interaction is uh, people are generally building more underground structures or like uh, subterranean properties such as basements foundation um, and it's that uh, so it's whenever you add new structures directly into the soil that is um, influencing the interaction uh, between this tunnel and other structures that is um, affecting the disturbances that uh, the, you can feel when you're in a particular building um, i'm not particularly sure about the aging problem but definitely if you add in more structures within the other neighboring uh, structures in the soil, it will increase the interaction effect. I think I think adding adding on top to that, um, I think there is maintenance uh, for the infrastructure in place, uh, such that you you kind of maintain the roughness uh, of the rail um, to 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 avoid problems. Uh, but I'm not I'm not really sure what is the impact of the aging per se. Uh, so when when the tube lines are, are getting older and older. Um, but it's, it, it is a maintenance problem uh, at the end of the day. Yeah, I think here we have a more uh, general question. Could you please save the presentations? Uh, I think the presentation is recorded and uh, it will shortly, we will shortly inform you on which platform you will be able to access the presentations again. Um, yeah. So it is it so we talked about new buildings. So we have a new building with your piled foundations and how you want to uncouple the vibrations from a from a underground railway. How about existing buildings? You know, there's a lot of buildings in London that have the railway, the under the tube going beneath them, and there's a lot of vibration in the buildings. 
is there any easy fix or something that won't be very expensive on how to uh, to uh, stop some of the, the vibration and making the, uh, the windows from vibrating or the entire uh, house from vibrating? Jason, I can. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can you can play around with the with this. I mean, it never happened to me, so I'm not really sure. But just thinking aloud here, you you can play around with the dynamics of the of the floor that you have. So depends on the problem that you have. If it is rattling of window, probably can be a low frequency vibration problem rather than a related noise. Um, and for that, it might be more difficult to to do something uh, without extensive uh, uh, extensive uh, retrofitting uh, to the building itself. Uh, if it is a related noise problem, uh, you know, and it is a localized uh, problem, you can, in principle, try to understand what is the source of that. Mm -hmm. If there is a particular frequency that is, for some reason, uh, excited more and you can play around with the uh, dynamics of the floor plate to avoid that resonance. Um, yeah, it is it is a complex uh, system. Unfortunately, there is there is the there isn't an easy an easy fix, easy answer. Yeah, I think you're right. You either, as you probably mentioned, you, you either need to find identify the source and try and find a way to uh, prevent the transmission of the vibration in the building, or as you say, case by case on which of these uh, structural elements is or architectural elements is causing the vibration. Yeah, it is a little bit of an investigative work. Uh, also, the vibration service that we do just to characterize the vibration climate, uh, because otherwise you wouldn't know what you know what, what frequency is is more excited uh, in that, at that site for some reason, for some sources. So there is a little bit of investigative work to do to be done. Yeah. So we have another question from uh, Ian Ward. Excellent presentations. Thank you. Are there plans to produce tools standalone or linked to commercial software that will be available to engineers working in this area? Um, so I'm hoping to, so currently I'm at the end of my PhD and I'm hoping to probably, probably do a postdoc after this, that, and that one of the main aims of the postdoc will be to generate commercialized tools that, uh, engineers can use in practice. And currently the main tool, um, as I mentioned, pipe in pipe, that is currently being used quite a bit, uh, but that only includes the tunnel. So my hope is to add the user developers model similar to parking pipe, but account for now you can add in building uh, foundations and also buildings into your model. Um, and something that is also computationally efficient, so you can run them in maybe less than an hour to get some useful results. Um, there, are, there are plans to... There is, um, there is also under development um, uh, an application, a MATLAB application that I that I did during my PhD, just for the isolation performance. So not looking at uh, absolute prediction of vibration levels, uh, but just looking at uh, the isolation performance uh, itself. Um, not sure when that will will come uh, will come to fruition, uh, but I'll keep you posted. Uh, thank you. There's another question from Grace Yu. Thank you very much for your presentation. While the isolation of superstructure from the foundation may reduce ground-borne vibration impact, are there any limitation of this method? Uh, are you reading the questions from the chat? Uh, yes. Yes. So this is from Grace Yu. It says, while the isolation of superstructure from the foundation may reduce ground board vibration impact, are there any limitations of this method? I think perhaps she's referring to uh, Tiesel's um, method when he mentioned that the uh, building effect is not as significant as the foundation effect. Perhaps this is what uh, is mentioned here. Um, like sometimes you, um, like depending on what, uh, what modes of vibration is more dominant, uh, there have been studies that have shown, like if you have, um, if you have, um, if you have a long particular building and you have a set of isolation uh, bearings, um, if you have transverse vibrations, you can sometimes have instances where instead of 
uh, attenuating vibration, you can get amplification, uh, where yeah. you can sometimes get white power flow into the building rather than out um, the building, which is what you would want. Um, and that mainly happens when, like, no, isolation is typically good in the vertical direction, um, but sometimes when you have transverse motion, you can get some interesting effects where you where you get power flow in rather than it being attenuated uh, by the isolation. Yeah. So usually when 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 you when you set up an isolation system, you have lateral restraint, um, and then it becomes difficult. Um, to understand, as you, may, you were mentioning, uh, Tisal, whether external sources that are in the low frequency range may actually make things worse from the vibration side of thing, because base, base isolation is, is essentially related to acoustics and to radiating noise, which is relevant uh, at high frequencies. Um, so that, you know, one limitation that may occur is that you need to understand what are the other external sources um, that are, that can be um, uh, crucial for the building, such that, you know, vibration in that range is, 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 is not uh, making thing, things worse uh, from the vibration side of things. Uh, not the acoustic. Um, yeah, I, I'm afraid I need to to leave. Um, it's it's interesting to see how how many questions we've got. If if we have any opportunity think, to answer that, uh, I think there's, right. there's just one, one last question. It says, what kind of cracking can you expect on the structural walls and slab of an existing basement if it's due to the vibration from nearby tube tunnels? Interesting question. Um, yeah. We are so all this this work that we presented and the applications that we we have discussed uh, are definitely in the uh, linear elastic regime uh, of of materials. Uh, so uh, th this is a, uh, another kind of uh, uh, aspect of, of it, if you will. Uh, so looking at the peak particle velocity and. Uh, looking at structural com cosmetic damage and 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 all of that, um, and it is it is difficult to answer with a, a comprehensive. Uh, uh, yeah, so I I wouldn't know how to answer that. I don't know if this all. Um, so I think I will add that uh, most of the time when you're dealing with vibration from tubes, you it normally um, affect. It's more to do with. Um, human disturbances, so people being annoyed by the vibration, or like it disturbs people's sleep patterns. There have been studies shown where it can affect uh, particularly annoyance um, in humans, um, rather than being um, affecting cracking, um, because the amplitudes of the vibration are quite low. They're much lower than, say, seismic vibration. Um, so the because the amplitudes are not low, uh, it doesn't affect structural damage that much. Uh, it mainly it can mainly be a problem for if you have vibration sensitive equipment, for example, or if you're designing a building for concerts, like theaters, concert halls, where you don't want external noise influencing the vibration. That's when uh, base isolation, things like that can be effective. Yeah. And I, I think we just have one last comment, not a question from Mike Kong saying, just saying I'm working on a tunnel project using blasting. The PPV limits were never exceeded, but residents of certain buildings could still be affected by the ground board noise. Yeah, that, that could be the case. Yes, and that, that is uh, in a way, you know, just uh, substantiates what, what I was mentioning. Um, that, you know, very low vibration levels can cause a related noise that can be uh, heard by people. Um, yeah, yeah, that's 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 could be the case. All right, uh, thank you very much, uh, both uh, Tiso and Thank Giuseppe. you. Thank, thank you. It was you very interesting. Us. And uh, I hope everyone enjoyed the presentation and uh, have a nice evening. Thank you. Bye -bye. you too. Cheers. Thank bye. You. Bye, everyone.